bit from Kent Police, <laughs> okay, and just listen to what this officer is going to say to you. Mate, it's 5.35, yeah. and I'm arresting you suspicion of the murder of Alexandra Morgan, okay? We believe that you were the last person that Alexandra Morgan was seen to be alive with. In relation to the um, investigation into the murder of Alex Morgan, this was a uh, initially started out in a missing person inquiry, uh, which Kent Police uh, picked up in the middle of November 2021. Uh, Alex, 34 years of age at the time, uh, two very young children, a uh, single mum, trying to make ends meet. She'd uh, planned to go away for the weekend and she was due to come back on, on a Wednesday. Uh, and when she didn't return, her parents started to uh, have some real concerns for her. Kim Police then picked her up those inquiries in relation to her going missing. Uh, a number of inquiries took place, a search of her home address, uh, some checks on a mobile phone, uh, a call history, uh, a data session to uh, try and understand who the last person she was in contact with, whereabouts she could have been. Subsequently, uh, they gave an indication that Alex could have uh, headed towards the Sussex area. One of the key things I, was, I wanted to do clearly was to find Alex, but I always believed her car would lead us to finding her. Uh, and that was the objective that I set our team. Uh, was tracking Alex's vehicle by CCTV. Uh, uh, a number of officers were tasked with that inquiry. Uh, and that was a substantial inquiry because we were trying to track Alex's vehicle from basically Cranbrook all the way to Westfield, where we eventually saw her last sighting. That's a distance of about 18 miles. And it took them over a day and a half to reach uh, a point where we last saw Alex Morgan's vehicle with her in it. Now, subsequently, that was quite key because what that CCTV did show was her turning into a farm track, which didn't appear to go anywhere. Uh, however, she followed a gold Jaguar onto that site uh, of who we now know belonged to Mark Brown and was driven by Mark Brown at that time. Uh, we carried on with our inquiries to establish where uh, Alex had gone. And, and the main line of inquiry there was still viewing the CCTV. We had a last sighting now, and within about 36 hours, I believe, it was, we never saw Alex Morgan come off that site in her mini. Mark Brown was uh, uh, raised to a suspect, and he was subsequently arrested. The inquiry then took us to another stage whilst Mark Brown was in custody, uh, and that was to examine uh, the place where he worked at the time. We know he, he worked for a local uh, construction company uh, and we started to do some inquiries with them. We were searching that, that particular place for any clues that, that could lead us to Alex. And in conversation with the landowner, he actually reported that Mark Brown had asked if he could just put something uh, in the skip, if he didn't mind, that was at that location, which led us to check that skip and within there, there was an oil barrel. Within that oil barrel was a, um, a carrier bag. Uh, and within that carrier bag was a, a hairdryer and a pair of hair straighteners, amongst some other items. We sent those off for DNA testing. Uh, and very quickly, they came back as the DNA of Alex Morgan. However, there was still a lot of work to do. Um, and at that time, we had um, senior CSI, or crime scene uh, examiners, at that location. And they located something which didn't, ring, didn't look quite right. There were a number of very small items, about the size of your fingernail, at the bottom of an oil drum, uh, which had clearly been set fire to. Uh, and upon their recommendation and advice, they advised to get a forensic anthropologist in to have a look at this. And they subsequently came down, uh, had a look at some of these fragments that they'd found, uh, and very quickly, they were able to say they were human, human bone uh, of at least one person. Within there, uh, and, and they're again very small, but within there were a number of teeth. So once we had established and recovered all those fragments of bone and teeth, uh, we uh, employed the services of a, a forensic odontologist who was able to um, do a very accurate assessment of that and through the records was able to say that those teeth belonged to Alex Morgan. Um, it, was a, it was a very difficult conversation to have with Alex's parents, as you can imagine. It's, it's relief in some, in some sense, but 
I mean, the, the, um, the trauma and, and the angst they must have felt by knowing what, what have probably happened to Alex um, may live with them forever. And that kind of brought us to the stage where we were, in, we were, we were satisfied, we found Alex, we were satisfied that we got the right person in custody, charged, uh, and we were then building towards the, the trial process. What I did ask was for a review of uh, any exhibits uh, and items that had been recovered from Alex's property within a rollerblade box in one of her son's bedrooms. Uh, there was a number uh, of items. There was about two and a half thousand pounds in cash left in that rollerblade box and along with a mobile phone. Interestingly, there was a note that was left with that, with those items, uh, and it said the words to the effect of, if anything happens to me, um, tell the police and check this location out, which turned out to be Little Bridge Farm. There was also another note left in his bedroom, which was the pin code to that mobile telephone. When my officers examined that mobile phone, uh, it was quite chilling. There were a number of text message conversations between Alex Morgan and Mark Brown. And this is where Mark Brown had really preyed on the vulnerability of Alex. He kind of set this elaborate um, story where she was going to go and work for him, just merely for a, work, for a weekend where she could earn £100,000. I think the sad thing here, Alex, single mother, vulnerable, wanted the best for her two children and felt it was too good an opportunity to miss out. But she clearly was switched on enough to leave a trail behind just in case it wasn't quite right and something went wrong. Leah Ware was reported as a missing person to Sussex Police by Kent Police after they found prescription medication belonging to Leah in a vehicle owned by Mark Brown. We started a missing person investigation and it became apparent quite quickly that nobody had seen or heard from Leah for quite some time, up to six months. As we started to look in more detail at her mobile phone usage, her financial transactions, her interactions with medical professionals and also with her friends and family, we became increasingly worried that something bad had happened to her. We knew that Leah had been in a relationship with Mark Brown for some time and that she'd lived in a caravan and then in a shipping container on a farm that Mark Brown rented outside of Hastings. From the investigations that we carried out, it became apparent that Mark Brown would have been the last person to see Leah before she disappeared, and yet he'd reported no concerns and hadn't uh, mentioned anything to the police or anyone else about what had happened or why she had disappeared. In the months after her disappearance, Mark Brown made efforts to make it appear that Leah was still alive. He collected her medication regularly and also he made financial transactions using her bank account. His behaviour did create suspicions as he gave many conflicting accounts of what had happened to Leah and why people didn't see her. He suggested that she'd been admitted to hospital and then when concerned friends said that they wanted to go and visit her, he told them that they wouldn't be able to see her. All the people we've spoken to about Leah have been very clear about her love of animals. One of the things that Mark Brown did after her disappearance was give away one of her dogs. Everyone that we've spoken to agrees that she would never allow anything to happen to any of her animals or be given away were she alive. Although we've never found Leah's body, we've always been confident that she's come to harm at the hands of Mark Brown. And whilst no body homicides are incredibly rare and difficult to prove, through really strong partnership working with our colleagues at Kent Police and with the Crown Prosecution Service, we were able to build a really strong case that demonstrates that Mark Brown is responsible for Leah's death. Leah was a loving and trusting young woman. Sadly, her life wasn't without difficulties and she became dependent on Mark Brown and he used that to his advantage until ultimately it led to her death. The simple truth is that Mark Brown is a dangerous man, seeking to exploit vulnerabilities to his advantage and ultimately betraying two women that right to the end has continually claimed to care for. I personally am pleased that he's been caught and that he won't be at liberty to harm any other women.